Good evening, everybody. I'm Alan Levine, professor in the Department of Government at American University, and together with my colleague, Tom Merrill, I run the Political Theory Institute, the sponsor of today's program. Uh, first, a, a few quick words. We have, uh, we're offering the following political theory classes, uh, theory seminars this spring. Uh, 496.003 is a class on Nietzsche taught by Borden Flanagan. 496.004 is a class on African-American political thought taught by me. Government 326 is on American conservative political thought taught by Matt Continetti, one of the nation's leading conservative voices. And Government 405, modern political thought taught by Gabe Whitbread. Tonight's talk marks the end of our 25th celebration uh, year of a political theory lecture series at American University. And this series has deeply enriched the AU community and me personally. And so I'd just like to take this opportunity to uh, thank several people who have made this possible. First, the comms team, especially Mackenzie Oldham and Chanel Ashman, uh, thank you for helping making these things easy. Dean Vicki Williams has been a great supporter of PTI financially and emotionally. Uh, thank you, Dean Wilkins. Tom Merrill, Borden Flanagan, Sarah Hauser, Gabe Whitbread, Jeremy Janow, Chris Utter, and Brad Jackson are wonderful colleagues and conversationalists. Thank you. And Tom Merrill especially has helped me grow this thing from uh, a local to a national powerhouse. So thank you, Tom. And finally, I'd like to thank our wonderful students and alumni, the next link in the chain. Tonight, we're, we are privileged to have with us uh, a, a duo, a husband and wife, Benjamin Story and Jenna Silber Story. Uh, it's the first time in our 25 years, I think we've had a, a couple as uh, speakers together. Uh, they both teach in the Department of Politics and International Affairs at Furman University, where he is the Jane Gage Hip Professor. We always knew you were hip uh, <laughs> professor, and she's an assistant professor. Together, they run Furman's Tocqueville program, an intellectual community dedicated to investigating the moral and philosophic questions at the heart of political life, much like our Lincoln Scholars program. Both have been recognized for outstanding teaching. This year, they're both visiting fellows in the Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies Division of the American Enterprise Institute. Ben has previously been a visiting fellow at the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton, and Jenna has published in several edited volumes, as well as in Perspectives on Political Science, The Washington Post, The Irish Times, First Things, RealClearBooks.com, The New Atlantis, Vogelin View, and The Boston Globe. Ben earned his BA from the University of North Carolina. Jenna earned hers from Boston University, and they both have earned MA and PhD degrees from the University of Chicago's Committee on Social Thought. Together, they are the, the co-authors of this book that's going to serve as the basis of our conversation today, Why We Are Restless on the Modern Quest for Contentment. So I'd like to just say at the outset, it's a very good book on an extremely important topic. And it's beautifully written without any jargon. Um, uh, it's, so in that way, it's good for, I'm saying this to students out there, it's good for your semi-intellectual parent or your cantankerous uncle who's always complaining about what's wrong with kids these days. Uh, this book is, is, will make a nice stocking, stocking stuffer. And it's only about five inches. I think it will fit in most. Uh, <laughs> ordinary size stockings. Uh, but yet at the same time, it, it is very erudite. Uh, it's very learned, full of scholarship, and, but it's all pushed into the footnotes. So if you're a scholar, you read the notes and you see who they're conversing with um, and, and it's really nicely done. So I congratulate you on your accomplishment. I have a quarrel, one quarrel with the book, which I'll get into uh, in due time. But first, I just want to start with the problem of restlessness today. Um, and the beginning of the book, the preface, you explain how you come to this problem. And, and so would you talk to that? Sure. Well, thank you, Ellen, for inviting us to, to address this um, 
this group tonight. And thank you also for inviting us to address your class just before this. I just, that was a wonderful engagement with uh, 20 or so students who had had the opportunity to read some of the, the work that had gone into our book and a shorter piece we'd written after we wrote the book. And um, I, I just, I'll put in a little, since you put in a plump for our book and as a stocking stuffer, let me put in a little plump for, for your class. Cause I think it's a wonderful idea to have some students engage more deeply with the material before they get to hear it presented in this public way. Um, Okay, so you asked about restlessness, how we came to see this as a problem and why we decided to, to spend some years writing about it. Uh, for us, uh, it came to our attention first as a pedagogical problem, a problem that we encountered as professors in a liberal arts college setting um, where we're expected and, and we love to mentor students over a number of years. And um, we found ourselves just one too many times sitting with students in the fall, typically of their senior year who were uh, having kind of meltdowns, right? So maybe you're going through this now. Maybe you see your friends going through this. Um, if you're a professor, you see it not just once or twice in your life, but many, many times, right? So we started to think about this problem. Why are our students, including our best students, including those students who have like hit every mark, getting good grades across the spectrum of classes they're asked to take, um, who have not only just been, you know, holed up in the library, but they've also been involved in extracurricular life as we as a college encourage them to do. They've not just stayed at home, they've gone abroad, they've gotten internships, they've done everything we ask them to do. Why are those students not kind of launched at the end of their college career, but why are they kind of fizzling, right? Um, as teachers and mentors, we want to help them make that transition from the time at which in which they're in their parents' house to the time at which they can they can sort of walk off on their own, right? And we felt like this wasn't going very well. So we're trying to describe what's happening um, when we're watching these students before us. And um, we, we chose the word restlessness and, uh, initially to describe um, this phenomenon. And what we meant by that was the kind of restlessness, which um, is, you see in a kind of inward, front, uh, a, a kind of freneticism inside, right? So you kind of all balled up in yourself. And at the same time, you're not going anywhere, right? So lots of internal motion, but not a lot of external <laughs> motion, like productive motion, right? Um, it's a really hard state to see people in, right? And uh, maybe another thing that characterizes restlessness we saw is that students, uh, the way that students were thinking about what they were gonna do with the rest of their lives went from being something that, you know, more or less remained within the 50 yard lines. We teach in a politics department. So it's often, I don't know, PhD or maybe law school, PhD law school. And then all of a sudden they were entertaining totally wild options for which frankly, you know, an experience at a liberal arts college does not prepare you like soybean farming or pulling up in grandma's attic, right? Or giving up on reading altogether, right? So. Things just so are you anti soybean and anti grandma? <laughs> <laughs> well, my my point is like they're she's really pro grandma. I'll, let me just let that tag out of the back. But anyway, go ahead. Totally <laughs> outside of their experience, right? So, like, why isn't our experience preparing them to think better about the kinds of things you would typically do coming out of a liberal arts college, right? Was the question. And but once we started to kind of under think, get our minds around this question we noticed that it really wasn't just a problem with our students. We started to see it in ourselves and also even in the way that we were sort of implicitly um, raising our children and telling them how to go about uh, living their lives. We started to see it in people around us. And when, once that happened, we started to connect it with um, a number of thinkers that we had been reading uh, for years, a series of French thinkers. The first one that came to mind was Alexis de Tocqueville, in part because he has a wonderful chapter that we had read individually, separately as undergraduates, called why are Americans so restless in the midst of their prosperity? And that question seemed to kind of crystallize the problem that we were seeing before us because our students had, you know, all the advantages that one has in a kind of cushy, beautiful, um, well-supplied liberal arts college, and yet they were restless and unhappy. And so we started to look at this, we started to read that chapter more seriously, started to read that chapter with our students. And, um, started to think about this as potentially a particularly American problem. Um, but then we, we realized as um, we sort of pieced together this, uh, our thoughts on Tocqueville 
and um, on the thinkers that Tocqueville himself drew upon to make this observation, this acute observation about American life, that this was really a problem um, that Tocqueville was made aware of by the history of French thinking about restlessness. So that's, that's the story of our book. It culminates in Tocqueville and it tells the story of French thinking in a particular tradition, a particular conversation about human restlessness, how we might solve it, can we solve it? Is it insoluble? What do we do with it? Good. So I, I want to just echo your observations on restlessness because I find it with my students all the time, too. And kids who who sort of artificially, I think, choose some path that they don't really know why they've done that. And then at some point in time, they get exposed to many different goods and many different options, and they feel like they have no basis to choose. And, and so they start waffling and going all over the place. And, and because they feel like they don't know how to choose, it leads to a big existential crisis. Um, do, do your students have those kinds of crises too? This is, this is really the, the heart of what we're thinking about is we're at a liberal arts college. You're at a college with a, a, a liberal arts element. And it's the liberal arts ought to be helping people know how to choose. And so the, the, problem, the problem in students with which our observations really began is why aren't these, why aren't colleges doing a better job putting these people in a position to choose among their options? They're very good at putting options on the table. There's lots <laughs> to do at a college like Furman or, or, or a university like, like American, I'm sure. But how do you choose? And we think that liberal education ought to be a kind of education that allows people to rank goods, to say, this is something of the highest importance and I couldn't live my life well without it. Whereas this other thing, I, I kind of like it, but you know what? I could do without it if I had to. Instead, it seems like there's a whole variety of goods, any of which might turn out to be the, the, the one thing needful, or rather, more often, none of these things is the one thing needful. The, um, all of them are just kind of good. And that leads one in a position of living a life that consists of just like, like, like being a waiter with a lot of stuff balanced on a tray. And, and because it's tipping on one side, well, you try to stick something on the other side. And so you just keep adding stuff. The, um, and I think this is the way life looks on a lot of college campuses, but not just on college campuses. I think this is the way life looks for a lot of American adults, the, uh, including at times ourselves. And so I think part of the reason we got interested in, in, in thinking about this was to help us think through a problem that is not just a problem for students, but I think a problem for lots of people in America. And, and in this sense, the, the book was not just a, a, an effort to understand something scholarly, something that, about other people, but an attempt to understand something about us. Yeah, nice. Um, and, and, and I also know what you're talking about with the university because I mean, our universities are not uni. Right? There's, yes. there's not a focus. Mm -hmm. There's not a driving principle of organization. It's just a giant smorgasbord. And, and, and everybody can choose what they want as they want. Um, and if you choose this, you know, sometimes, well, you have to have these as the sides, right, mm -hmm. <laughs> in the major or something. Uh, but but we, we lack that, that kind of focus. Um, let, let me ask you about the title of the book. All right. So there's two parts. There's the, the main title and the, the uh, subtitle. The main title is Why We Are Restless. And the subtitle is On the Modern Quest for Contentment. And so I guess my question is, is restlessness a universal condition, you know, part of human nature that all humans everywhere feel, feel, feel restless? Um, or is restlessness simply a modern problem, right? And it's a universal problem. It could have a particular modern shape, right? But, but how, how do you see it? Yeah, thanks, Alan. That, that's, that's very good. Uh, the way you put it at the end there, I think we do, it's, we would agree with that statement that restlessness is a human problem. It's kind of baked into who we are. And in part, that's because we are just imperfect, right? We're restless because we don't have it all. We can't just rest where we are. We want to know things, but we don't know it all. 
We want to be healthy, but we get sick. Um, we want to be good people, but we fail, right? So there's going to be a kind of indeterminacy and therefore a kind of motion and restlessness in human life. Um, what we're particularly focused on in this book is a kind of modern effort to, um, I don't think it's too strong to say solve the, the problem of human restlessness, or at least reduce it to something that no longer seriously disturbs us either personally or politically. And so the book begins with, um, the, the, the book proper begins with an um, analysis and an appreciation of Michel de Montaigne, who tried to articulate um, a way in which to tamp down the restlessness of his time. He lived in a time of, of great religious war, so the restlessness was, was all, all around him. Um, to try to tamp down the restlessness of, of that time and give us a model by which we might live so that we weren't uh, disturbed by what is this, what I'm more calling a kind of fundamental feature of human life, this restlessness. And the story of the book is really a story of how um, Montaigne suggested this model. We think it was a very reasonable suggestion at the time, but it was uh, debated. It started a conversation among a number of French thinkers in a particular tradition um, about whether that solution was uh, workable, let's say. And um, about whether, and started a sort of conversation in our minds about whether it's really the appropriate solution to, to our problems. Yeah, and, and the, you deal with four French thinkers, Montaigne, Pascal, Rousseau, and Tocqueville. And, and I think I'd like to just kind of run through them all, you know, kind of quickly, the, the way you see the, the story unfolding. Um, and so let's start with Montaigne. And he, he seems a little bit like the villain here with, with an idea that, uh, is fundamentally problematic and and leads to the the problems that that we experience today. Is is that correct? Is he the villain? Uh, yes and no. Uh, no, insofar as uh, we have tried to write a chapter on Montaigne that is a full appreciation of his. Uh, many virtues, and we really do think his virtues are many. His charm as a writer is extraordinary. His originality is uh, really profound. There are, uh, you know, Alan, you and I are both people who've been reading Montaigne for a very long time, and I'm sure your head is as full as mine is of little Montaigneisms, little aphorisms that he lays out that you can never forget and that come up in all kinds of places. And so in this sense, you know, we, we want to be as sympathetic as we can be to Montaigne's genius while still asking him some serious questions. And so we think that Montaigne's, Montaigne's response to the situation of religious war uh, through which he lived is an entirely understandable and in many ways admirable response. But at the end of the day, we do think that he presents us with a picture of human life that doesn't actually satisfy the deepest longings of the human soul. And we want people, we think it is useful for people to pay more serious attention to those longings. Because I think they're the sort of things that creep out the sides if you try to sort of press down on them from above, which is in a way what you, uh, which is a way in which you might describe what Montaigne is doing. So in this sense, I don't know that the Montaigne solution holds water in the long run. Okay, and you 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 label Montaigne's phrase, use this uh, his solution with the phrase "imminent contentment," and you talk about that throughout. What is imminent contentment, and how do you think Montaigne is is? What does he mean by it? What do you? Uh, um, uh, how do you see the the parts of that? The, well, it, we, we coined the phrase imminent contentment because as you, as you noted a little bit earlier, Alan, we tried to write a jargon-free book, but we did have to publish it with the university press. So we figured we'd better stick in some jargon. <laughs> the, uh, Seriously. <laughs> and so we, we went we, back and put that in. <laughs> that's, uh, that's right. And so we, but we came up with this, but we do think it, it, it captures something, which is 
Um, Montaigne, as, as, as you're well aware, the, the greatest chapter of the essays is a, um, is a chapter called The Apology for Ramon Sebald. And it's a gigantic manifesto for skepticism. But actually, it's not so much a manifesto as an attempt to make the reader experience skepticism. That is, it, 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 it makes you experience doubt. And it, because Montaigne, he, he looks at all the answers that have been given to all the fundamental questions of human life. And he looks at the people who have given these answers. And he shows us that, first of all, there is no consensus answer to any of the basic questions like, what is the human good? Secondly, the people who are trying to answer these questions are often kind of absurd. Like, you know, you've got this guy like Diogenes who's living in a barrel, and you've got Thales, the astronomer, who like, tumbles into a well because he's looking up at the stars. You know, why do we have to take these people so seriously? Montaigne seems to ask. And so he, what I think he tries to lay out in the essays is a vision of human life that just doesn't suppose we know the answers to these questions uh, and doesn't really think we need to care. And so Montaigne shows himself living what looks like an intellectually engaged, kind of uh, morally decent, amusing, various, humane, honest, kind of splendid life the, um, without dealing with uh, these sorts of questions. And so that's what we mean by imminent contentment is how do human beings make themselves happy when they foreclose what you might call the existential questions? When they say, yeah, we're never gonna come up with any answer to these things. Yeah, and so just to follow up on what my husband was saying, um, I think a lot of times we fancy that if you foreclose the existential questions or you just don't ask them, you think they're not answerable and you're living the life of a skeptic, essentially, in that, that, that manner, that you can live in lots of different ways, right? This can look like lots of different things. That's part of, part of its attraction, the, the ostensible diversity of it or freedom of it. But one thing we became attentive to as we were you know, examining the world around us and the way that say our students were living or, or people around us, um, adults around us were living is that there's not as much diversity in this as one might think, right? Basically, those people who follow what we're calling a kind of Montanian model of skepticism are living a distinctive way of life. It is one that finds, it seeks its happiness in a diversity of imminent content contentments, <laughs> right? A diversity of things around them. So, you know, if uh, if you're, um, uh, excuse me, I lost my train of thought. So um, it, it promises a kind of uh, beautiful diversity, but it actually delivers a, a rather homogenous way of life, right? Which has its attractions, but also has its, its downsides. Yeah, so, it, it, that, that's interesting to me because you're you're thinking about the um, the the consequences moving forward of Montaigne's mm -hmm. thought, and um, and and to to me this is my this is my one quarrel with the book. Mm -hmm. um, it, it seems to me you're reading Montaigne too much from what comes out of him a couple of hundred years in the future, and thereby ignoring a lot of richness in him and a lot of depth that actually I think would help um, promote the kind of questioning, uh, the real questioning and ranking that you two are really interested in. Um, so let, let me talk about three maybe that were areas where I think uh, your Montaigne's a little too shallow, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and then you tell me you know, uh, why you disagree. So the first one, has to do with uh, Montaigne's view of the self, right? What is a self and, and how should some self live? And you write, I'm gonna just say a, a series of quotes from the book now, that attempts to, to rise above our animality breeds self-loathing and derangement. So as if he wants to, to you know, really reinforce the animal in us. Another line, quote, Montaigne's art of imminent contentment teaches a human being to seek happiness like a cat lying in the sun. I read that and I was like, really? Montaigne lives in the south of France and he never talks about going to the beach or anything. He spends his time in his castle reading, 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 reading over and over and over again, right? And you said, the question of how should I live, you say he changes to by saying simply live. 
And to me, there's nothing simple about what Montaigne's solution about how to live. I mean, it's true he's saying that like some unreflective people will just live how they live, and he doesn't want to simply put them down for that. But anybody who's thinking, any thinking person, finds themselves alienated from themselves in, and full of contradictions in many, many different ways. Um, and he's trying to, to, to take all those things, to think through all of those things, to, to bring us back to ourselves in, in a truer, deeper way, right? Similarly, you say, how should I live by, uh, um, uh, okay, yeah, anyway. And, and along those lines, one other thing on that point of the self, you're right, he doesn't want to exercise the into that intellectual part of ourselves. And you're talking about Aristotle there, right? But I mean, what is an essay? What is his book? What is his life, if not an exercise of the intellectual part of ourselves, right? I mean, so so take that one. Good. The, uh, this is, the, the, the thank you. I I I, I kind of uh, I kind of suspected this was coming and uh, and and hoped. I warned so, you. The uh, so um, the self and the reinforcement of the animal. We don't think. We think that Montaigne is thinks the human malady is the attempt to rise above ourselves. So there's very frequent in Montaigne's pages, you find these mm -hmm. critiques of presumption. Mm -hmm. He thinks presumption is an enormous human problem. And so I think he directs us back toward the animals. But to say that he directs us back toward the animals is not to say that he wants us to live a merely animalistic life. There's a, there's a line that you've quoted, Alan, which I've, which, I, which I've really fixated on, that he wants a life that is um, uh, essentially intellectual and intellectually sensual. He wants to do some of both. But this is exactly the recipe for imminent contentment, right? It's, you know, like Locke says, like, you shouldn't try to satisfy anybody's taste, everybody's taste with cheese or with lobster. Montaigne says, I'll have the cheese and the lobsters. That is, I'll have some thinking and I'll have lots of other stuff too. The, um, and I think that is, the, uh, that is the Montaignan formula. But I think the Montaignan formula, he doesn't think that we're going to be too animal if left to our own devices. He thinks we're going to try to fly above our human condition. He thinks that's the fundamental problem. So that's why we, we think that that's consistent with, with what Montaigne is doing in, in his attempt to direct the, the energies of his readers. So that's that's point yeah. one. Do you want to respond there? Well, well, yeah. So, I mean, I like that answer, right? Intellectually sensual, sensually intellectual. But that's to say the intellectual is, is part of it, right? And and But you have these lines where he doesn't want to exercise the intellectual. So I, I think there's a handful of places where you go too far uh, on that point. Maybe. I don't, I don't actually recognize that that line without without the, without the a fuller... Uh, Tell us the page it's on number. page 26. Okay. okay. The, um... I might, like off then I don't know if you want to look that up, but I think um, what, um, okay, to exercise the intellectual part of our, ourselves that Aristotle called most divine, right? So I think, I think what we're talking about, what we're trying to quarrel about or whatever here is what um, Montaigne yeah. means by intellectual exercise. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, someone doesn't read and write and so forth. That's an intellectual exercise, right? So it'd be absurd to say that um, that is not something that Montaigne did or in, implicitly recommends because he's engaging in it and presenting a, him, us with the results of his efforts. Um, but I think our claim here is that it's a fundamentally different kind of intellectual exercise and a fundamentally different and therefore a fundamentally different understanding of what the intellect is and what place it should have in human life than um, that uh, offered by Aristotle or Plato or Socrates, but, but that offered by um, uh, the classic thinker. So I think um, we would make a, a distinction between Montaigne and Socrates, whereas other people, I'm not sure if, if you fall into this camp or not, but other people would would uh, would bring them closer than we would then. I, yeah, I think just to add on to what Jenna's saying there, I think what we're saying is that Montaigne doesn't think the intellectual part of us is divine. That's the, uh, the I think that's the real distinction that we're trying to draw between him and an, and an Aristotle. Okay, so th so that right that I can accept, um, uh, but uh, and and so in a way, you know, I agree with you about the the imminence of his thought, right? And he wants to live sort of in the self without appealing to some kind of metaphysical thing. But, but given that uh, 
uh, uh, you know, cut off there. And, and it's not that he just says, oh, we can't know, so I'm never going to think about it, right? I mean, he thinks about everything, and he thinks about, I think, the most important human questions, right? And not only, you know, is there a God, but why do we want there to be a God? What is it about us human beings, right, that a God would satisfy so deeply, right? Mm-hmm. To, to raise the question about, you know, is there something about that that's an escape? Um, right. But it's but it's really deep probing. Wouldn't you agree? I, I agree that Montaigne is a very great psychologist and a really serious student of the hidden movements of the human soul. You know, the lines at the end of um, book two, chapter six, where he describes himself as a cadaver. Right. And he's like the cadaver is like on the table when you're reading the essays as Montaigne sort of exposes himself. But I think there's a really interesting fact about all Montaigne's moral inquiry, all of his intellectual inquiry, rather, which is that he tells us several times over the course of the essays that he never changes his mind about anything. Montaigne is exactly who he was when he was a kid, which suggests that there's something about there, there, there's something about all this activity that isn't really going anywhere. It's the way that Montaigne amuses himself, and he often sort of degrades it in just that sense. That is, he's not trying to elevate the philosophic life and say, everybody, you got to be a philosopher like me. He's, Montaigne is really a humanist who frequently says, I am no philosopher. He says this a couple of times. And I think he wants to elevate ordinary human life to a status that it has not previously enjoyed. And that is the genuine source of Montaigne's originality as we take it. Yeah. So it's true. He says sometimes he's not a philosopher. Other times he says he is, right? That he's an accidental, accidental philosopher, philosopher, right? right. From, from which I take it that he's not a philosopher in the dogmatic sense of I believe X and then, you know, just sort of arguing for that, right? Whatever. But what he is, is, is a thinker and an inquirer in a philosophical way, not out of principle, Right, that that's what he's determined simply is the best life, but that um, uh, that everything points back to the need for for a kind of a deep self knowledge and self understanding. And so, you know, aside from himself as the model of the book, it's Socrates, but it's not Socrates of the ideas of in the Republic, Book Six. It's Socrates. Uh, uh, who knows he knows nothing, who takes human, uh, uh, shows human powers to their edge, but without going over, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and I think, that, yeah, I think this is, I, I agree with you that Socrates is the kind of hero, particularly of the late essays, but it's a very selective Socrates, as you've just pointed out. And, uh, you know, there's more Xenophon than anything else and, and a good bit of Montaigne, the uh, frankly sort of, you know, uh, uh, tossed in there. And in this sense, I, I just think Montaigne's Socrates isn't Socrates because I don't really think that Socrates without the ideas is Socrates. The Socrates without the ideas is Socrates without the what is questions. And interestingly enough, I don't, I don't really think we see Montaigne making progress on those kinds of abstract questions right. that, um, that Socrates always poses. Okay, so I, I get that. Um, I would say it's 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 Socrates. He understands that Socrates asked those questions, right? But that Socrates doesn't feel himself, doesn't think himself that he has the answers to them sufficiently, right? And so everything is tentative, or I don't know, or I'm not really going to tell you, or I can't tell you, right? And instead, I'm going to do something else. So uh, let me, I, I want to go on to, 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 okay. to the other thing is, I have two more points on Montaigne that I want to raise, okay? And uh, the audience, you're going to have to indulge me. Um, but, but also, um, I, please, people, put your questions uh, and the Q&A function. Uh, we will come to those. And especially students, we were talking about the restlessness earlier. I meant to specifically invite you. It, to what extent do you feel this restlessness in your lives? Um, to what do you, how do you explain it? I, w- I would genuinely like to hear that. And I think the stories would too. Okay, so two other questions about Montaigne. The, the next one has to do with why he writes. And you write that he makes himself the essay's exclusive subject. Yes. Quote, merely to reveal himself. Uh, another line, uh, uh, and he's a new mode, has a new mode of self-understanding, autobiographical 
rather than theoretical, individual rather than general. That's the end quote. And, and I want to argue with the rather than, <laughs> right? Um, it seems to me that it's clearly both, right? It's autobiographical, but it's also theoretical. It's individual, but it's also general. So he tells us on the one hand, I am myself the matter of my book. And also on the other hand, the study I am making, the subject of which is man. Right, because he thinks there's enough similarity between every human that as he probes himself, you, the reader, will see what he's doing, and you can't help but do the same thing in yourself. And mm -hmm. so, as you talk about in the book, right, that so many people read Montaigne and say, How does he know me? How does he know this about me? And, and Montaigne knows that he knows, right, because he knows himself and therefore he knows others. And so, it's not simply you know, sort of bizarrely subjective, but he's actually advancing important claims and, and truth claims about human, the human condition. I think that's, uh, I think you're, you're very right in that Montaigne is investigating like all the human phenomena, but he tells us this is a way of better sounding the depths of himself that he's engaged in there. But I think that that mirror image thing that you're pointing out, I think that's really true. I think Montaigne does try uh, pretty aggressively to avoid abstractions. And I don't know that one can really make, if, if one's activity can really be theoretical without the deployment of abstractions. And that's what we mean in suggesting that what Montaigne is doing is engaging in an act of what we call, this is the other bit of jargon in the book, unmediated self-revelation in this case. He's going to throw his whole self on the table and he's not going to tell you, these are the good parts and these are the bad parts and these are the natural parts and these are the artificial parts. And uh, he's just going to say like, this is, this, is, this is the whole thing. And he kind of encourages and, and he sort of like puts the whole human world in there with that stuff. But that absence of the theoretical attempt to say, this is what's natural to me, and this is what's artificial, this is what's, uh, this is what's high, and this is what's low, leave us, uh, I think, a little short on the theoretical side when we consider Montaigne's enterprise. Okay, that, that leads exactly to my third point question, um, which has to do with this frankness that you talk about, yes. right? And so you variously talk about Montaigne as being frank, as putting on no airs, as embodying nonchalance, uh, nonchalance. Uh, to, so, so it will be, quote, within the reach of everyone, and quote, because he has nothing to hide. So to, to me, this is a real simplification. Um, and so you also talk about Montaigne's famous image of wanting an air boutique in the soul, a back shop in the soul. Well, why do we need a back shop? in our head mm. if you can put everything out front in the window, right? He doesn't think you can put everything out front in the window, right? And he says it, on the very first page of the book in the note to the reader, he says he wants to present himself in a simple natural form. And if he lived among nations, a nation that lived according to natural law, he would do so and then present himself entirely and wholly naked. But since he doesn't live in a nation like that, he doesn't and can't. Um, Right. And so and 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 this also ties in to the importance of role playing with him. So you talk in the book that the mayor and Montaigne are two. Right. It's a famous line of Montaigne's. He doesn't invest himself wholeheartedly in his jobs. And right. He is a human who plays roles. Right. And um, and that role playing is exactly the kind of. Um, uh, of, of non-frankness, right? Where you have to do what the role requires and, and not be simply and truly yourself. And so I think there's a lot of depth and a lot of layers in Montaigne um, that doesn't exist in the stuff that comes out of him. And that's where you take it, right? And I appreciate that. And I think you're right in taking it that way, that it gets, it gets shallowized and vulgarized in the future, but that, that does, that's not true for Montaigne himself. Would you agree, Alan, that Montaigne claims a very distinctive frankness for himself? Yeah, sometimes. Book yeah. three, chapter two, the very opening, the, um, where he says, 
the, there's frankness in my book as 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 pure as can be found. He suggests as pure as can be found because no one because to to be any franker would would be suicide. Look, that's uh, I think it's in a certain sense fair enough to say that Montaigne cannot entirely live up to his own claims of frankness and that he is aware of that, but that he presents that as a signal claim of the value of his book is, I think, a real thing. And I think that's uh, it is a real thing with legs um, as we as we go on through history. But I think it is. I, I so I wouldn't disagree with you that Montaigne is sometimes more complex than we allow, but that's because Montaigne is sometimes more complex than he allows, right? He pretends that he's simpler than he is. We're taking his simplicity, the um, we're taking his simplicity as the most important part of his public self presentation. Right. So okay. So I, I I get that. Right. He does present himself as simpler than he is in, in various ways. That with without a doubt. Right. But that's that's to say to not be truly frank. Right. And he's and he's doing that simplicity for 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 various reasons. I think which which we don't need to get into here. Uh, we've used a lot of time on Voltaire already. Um, uh, but, but in any case, let me just wrap this up. I say, whatever our disagreements are on Montaigne, right? I, I completely, I think my only, my, it, it could all be fixed in my opinion, if you would have just said that this is Montaignean, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to Montaigne, right? Mm -hmm. That there's something that comes out of this guy because everything you say is a part of Montaigne. But in my judgment, there are other parts of Montaigne that make him more complex and richer and more of value to us today, especially restless people today, um, because he really does dig deeper and try to focus on the self and what's really important and what are the, the reasons why we can't deal with what's important to us. Mm. Um, so, um, Well, let me just, uh, just uh, sorry, Jenna, did you want to say something to that? <clears throat> I was just going to ask uh, you to maybe ex just expand on that last uh, sentence, um, Alan. Like you, you're, you're, you're saying that Montaigne is actually somebody we need to repair to, to help us with the yeah. restlessness that you agree that we're describing a phenomenon that you're seeing and that is a problem. Absolutely. And Montaigne could actually assist there now i do i want to say we do we do I, I don't think we emphasize this maybe enough or maybe it needs to be said again we do think montaigne helped with the restlessness of his time we just think that our restlessness is following essentially montaignean pattern right and which is not to elevate your just typical montaignean without knowing that you're even a montaignean to the level of montaigne's genius obviously right but if our restlessness, let me let, let in our claim and ask you to respond to this. If our restlessness essentially follows a Montaigne pattern, how does like more Montaigneanism help that out? Right. Yeah, that's an excellent question. I would say our restlessness follows a half of a Montaignean pattern, right? Okay. A, a, a big thread of his thought, but that, that thread has its own corrections in his essays and in his dialoguing with himself and with him trying to think through the problems. And so, you know, nothing, I mean, Ben mentioned uh, uh, the presumptions, presumptuousness that Montaigne constantly critiques, right? All our best students, a lot of what they're trying to do is out of vanity, right? That, mm -hmm. they, that they try to do this because they think they should, important people do this, right? Their, their, their parents and their priests told them to do various things and, you know, and, and they want to get into Harvard and, and Yale. And so they want to do all these different things. And there's no better psychologist of that kind of vanity and, mm -hmm. and trying to unfurl what's really going on inside you when, you're, when you are giving up real goods in the world right now for the sake of these sort of illusory uh, fantasies. And, and so, and in, in many other ways too, with you know, fear, hope, uh, desire. And, and I also think that, uh, you know, I, I completely agree that we exist we live in a world of divertissement, right? Um, and Pascal describes that beautifully, but we're going to go to in a second. <laughs> um, uh, but I don't think that Montaigne lives a life of divertissement. 
I think that Montaigne is aware of all the attractions and all the things that take us away from our true deeper selves. And he looks at them and he pulls them out unlike anybody else, right? For us to see. And when he does that, you look at it and you're like, wow, yes, he's right. That's what's really going on in me. And, and therefore he helps free you from those things. Oh, well, that's a very good uh, defense of, uh, of, of Montaigne, Alan. I'd, I'd say a couple of things about it. One, I agree with you that uh, Montaigne is a great psychologist, but I don't think he's the greatest psychologist. I think Pascal is a superior psychologist because okay. I think he understands that there are certain uh, existential questions that we can't get away from in the way that I think, uh, that, in the way that I think uh, Montaigne does. Yeah. And secondly, I'm not sure that you can ultimately end up with anything other than uh, d um, diversion and dabbling on the basis of a Montaignean view of the world. Because I think that Montaigne unplugs the seriousness of our questions. And once that seriousness is unplugged, they, they are reduced to the status of diversions. Well, I'll just, I'll cite myself as somebody who <laughs> has benefited from Montaigne from all of these problems that, that we're talking about. And with, and with several good students that I've read, I sure. found them to benefit as well. But I want to go on now to Pascal, who you just called the superior psychologist, right? And, yeah. and so I want to talk about him. And, and, and I'll, I'll direct you to, you know, two phrases from your book to ask you to unpack for us. And one is that Pascal is the philosopher of honest sadness, yeah. honest sadness. And the other is that according to Pascal, the human centered life is inhumane. Yes. Can you explain those for us? Let's start Kenny, with you want to honest, start on these? Yeah. I'll start on honest sadness. Um, you can take up the thread. Um, so Pascal is the, um, the philosopher of honest sadness. Um, to, re to return to something I was uh, talking about when you asked about restlessness earlier and whether that's a human problem, Alan. Um, and I said, yes, human beings are created to, or they're, they just form, they are, right? The way we are, we are is um, we're, we're destined to be restless, right? Because we are incomplete, right? And so Pascal has a, a beautiful meditation on this that I was echoing earlier, where he says, we want, we want to know, but we find ourselves ignorant. Um, we want to be good, but we find ourselves failing, right? And so this is a drama I think all of us are familiar with. We, we always long for more perfection than we can attain. And in our, I think what Pascal's reading anyway, Montaigne, which I think we follow, is that Mon Montaigne is basically saying, as you said, put a, put a ceiling on those desires, right? Realize your human condition, as it were. Realize you are not going to know. You are not going to be good. And learn to live in that circumscribed sphere. Whereas I think uh, we describe Pascal as the philosopher of honest sadness, right? Because he doesn't- he... Just the description <laughs> breaks my heart. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, but, um, I, I wanna, I'll say something to that in a moment. Um, look, you know, this is just who you are. Let's be honest about the phenomenon that you experience and honestly that everybody experiences, right? We can't actually circumscribe our longings in the way that Montaigne is trying to encourage us to do. Um, and therefore, you know, the way out of this problem is, is to be, to face it squarely, not to try to get rid of it, right? So there is a kind of, um, a restless emotion in someone like Pascal, but it's not a motion that seems to put a ceiling on something and kind of divert outwards, but a motion that, that leads in a certain direction. Um, if I may say one more thing to Alan's comment that this depresses you or something like this. Um, yes, it could, well, sort of it could, but actually we've experienced in reading Pascal with students um, and in reading Pascal ourselves, but we get to see this all the time when we're presenting his thought or reading it with other people, that it can actually be relieving. To read, to read his account of human nature and to have someone you know, so thoughtful and so brilliant say to you, this is how it is. I mean, Pascal understood you know, far more about math mathematics, for example, than, than, than any of us do shortly on this, uh, mostly, most certainly on the Zoom call. Um, and yet he can see that his quest to know is, 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 
is not satisfied by his own, you know, brilliant mathematical explorations. Um, so in any case, when he's when he tells us that this is how things look at, even from you know his vantage point, I think it can be somewhat relieving because there's a pressure in our world, which I think is we say is a kind of Montanian pressure, um, democratized, and we can disagree about that maybe, but um, there's a pressure in our world. No, to, no disagreement there. <laughs> okay, it's a Monta it's a Montanian-like pressure to to seem happy, right? To 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 lower your expectations for what you can attain. And to regard those things you want to know but can't know as just off the table, right? And therefore, you should take pleasure in the moment. You should take pictures of it and send them around, right? And um, we we all experience this. Uh, if, if it's um, sort of envy at um, our friends' uh, pictures and 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 descriptions of their own seemingly carefree lives, right? And then we feel guilty about that, and that drives our our unhappiness inward and gives us fewer resources with which to, to deal with it and, and less company within, with which um, to explore it. I think just, I'll add just two notes to, to what Jenna was saying, the second in, in response to part of Alan's question, but the, um, <clears throat> that experience of reading Montaigne with students, Mont uh, excuse me, reading Pascal with students, Pascal has any number of fragments in which he just describes the terribleness of facing up to human mortality. He describes us, for example, as, as a, like a bunch of people running toward a cliff and, and, and holding up something in front of our faces so we don't see it. And when, when students read these passages in which Pascal says, like, I know why you can't sit still in your room. It's because you just don't want to face yourself. There is there is a palpable relief as Jenna was describing. They're like, oh, somebody finally said it. Somebody finally said the thing that I'm really experiencing. And I think that's, that's what's really powerful and liberating in Pascal. The, um, uh, the, what we meant by suggesting that a human-centered life is inhuman is this wonderful phrase of Pascal's. It's just, it's just three syllables in French. Man surpasses man. Man surpasses man. That is it's the lovely. human being cannot be self-contained. Our longings point beyond us and we have to follow those longings. It doesn't mean that we can't, it doesn't mean that our longings are always right. He certainly knows that. The, uh, but to try to deny that, to try to deny that, that the, horizon in, uh, the, the horizon of human seeking ultimately goes beyond the human for Pascal is to, is to deny what it is to be human as such. And that's what we, that's what we meant by suggesting that a merely imminent humanism really isn't a humanism at all. And, and so the lesson to just the bottom line from Pascal that you take away is, uh, is to be open to the biggest questions. Is yeah. that fair? To be a seeker in anguish, in anguish. Is, I, is I think the, the, the proper Pascalian language for this, that you know, Pascal says there are three kinds of people those who have found God and serve him, those who are neither seeking God nor, nor, nor uh, serving him, and those who haven't found God but are looking. The, um, Pascal is a believer, of course, but he's not a believer who thinks he can tell anybody else what to believe. He's a believer who seeks to move people from a situation in which they are not seeking, which he describes as unreasonable and unhappy, to a situation which they are seeking, which is not necessarily happy, but is reasonable. And from there, it's between the individual and the divine. He can try to sort of point us to some things that might get us over some hurdles, but he doesn't think that he can finally, he can finally, any human being can finally offer another human being the answer to those kinds of questions. We're, we're getting low on time. We've already gone past our portion of it, but I still want to talk about Rousseau and Tocqueville, but maybe yeah. Rousseau just very quickly. Because the, the lessons from Rousseau, I mean, you, you like the questions he raises and some of the critiques he makes, but you find his, solu his solutions, plural, right, to uh, be uh, implausible and, and teach us through their failure, right? Um, can, can you say what, maybe just quickly on each of those points, um, what, what are the questions in, in Rousseau for us today? Um, what are, what are the, 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 the 
where, the, where do those questions really drive home? And then what's the failure? So I think Rousseau's way of thinking about the, the human problem is as a problem of dividedness. And we are divided between our social inclinations and our solitary inclinations, between wanting to be for ourselves and wanting to be for others. And that's something you described a moment ago very nicely, Alan, in the way that you know, students are constantly doing things that they mm -hmm. think other people will like. The, um, and, and Rousseau is just a wonderful analyst of this kind of thing. But even when we try to be selfish, we don't know how. And that's the thing is that like, you know, we, 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 we try to figure out by uh, how to be selfish by looking at other people's versions of selfishness. It's really ridiculous. The, but it's also really true. So he sees us as, as profoundly divided between our social side and our solitary side. And Rousseau's system consists in a variety of experiments with, with sort of attempts to resolve this problem, this dividedness in one way or another. So we could be uh, authentically for ourselves, like his solitary walker, or we could be wholeheartedly for others, like his citizen. But I think you can already see the problem with Rousseau's whole system in the plurality of the solutions. Rousseau, he says, he calls his system sad. And I've, I, I've wondered for years, why does he call it sad? And I think the reason he calls it sad is because when you, when you begin as a divided bourgeois, and then you become a divided bourgeois who's read Rousseau, and then you turn out an even more divided bourgeois <laughs> because he, <laughs> he puts, he makes all these things look so wonderful, but they're in contradiction with each other. You know, like, oh, I'd love to be a Spartan, or maybe I should be a noble savage. And the two are not the same. And, um, and so this is the way in which we think Rousseau so does that that way of thinking about ourselves as divided between the social and the individual is very widespread and profound. Uh, we think that Rousseau is maybe the, the most powerful thinker who looks at things in that way. And he, I think he ultimately shows that you can't really get anywhere <laughs> the, uh, by try, trying to solve our problems uh, on, on a purely horizontal axis. Yes. Yeah. And, and so, so, so good that that uh, that last point goes to my last question about Rousseau. You write at the end that he proves that our dividedness is here to stay. Yeah. And right, but but is if our dividedness is here to stay, does that also apply to Pascal or because Pascal goes on a vertical axis, we can overcome those divisions? I don't think Pascal would think this is going to be any like large scale solution to human unhappiness. But I think he's got a better way of thinking about the problem that might lead to individual quests for happiness and frankly the divine that are more promising than the Rousseau and solutions. Yeah, good. And one of the things that I really like about the book is the way that you contextualize the thinkers. And so Pascal, and, and you know, in the in the course of working out these Montaignean ideas. Um, which I acknowledge are a real part of Montaigne, right? And, and move forward. And, right, and so in the 16th, in the, excuse me, in the 17th century, and Pascal is the context of the on et on. And in mm -hmm. the 18th century for Rousseau, it's the context of the bourgeois. And then in the 19th century, when we get to Tocqueville, it's America, the country that Mill calls all middle class. Right. And it's in America where where there is not this high, there is not this. And in the in the Tocqueville section, you talk about uh, you, you compare Montaigne's answer, which is for the sophisticated few you write there, which I think is right. But in the in the actual Montaigne chapter, it sounds like it's for everybody. But mm -hmm. in the in the in the uh, Tocqueville chapter. It's not about you're not we're not talking about the sophisticated few anymore. We're talking about the many, the average, the middle class. And mm -hmm. and how does this problem of imminent contentment work out according to Tocqueville in reality? OK, so, yeah, thanks for um, juxtaposing the Montaigne as he was presenting his vision of how to seek a good life to um, what Tocqueville was observing happening among Americans, because I think I think that is important. I think in some ways, um, when we were discerning kind of Montaignean elements in the way that our students were striving for happiness, there's a major difference, right? Which is that Montaigne himself doesn't seem to be anxious. Um, he claims to value uh, and, and strive for nonchalance, nonchalance over everything else, right? And, and um, potentially he achieved that. Um, he's articulating his way of life against the backdrop of a quite a 
uh, uh, um, well, both against the backdrop of, of the religious wars, right? So he's trying to find a solution to that, but also against um, a kind of social backdrop that he could he could um, take on take on faith. So there was there was established church, a monarchy, and so forth. In democratic in the democratic world, are we're having we try to imitate Montaigne, but we don't have the same success. There's a kind of um, constant motion to our life that makes us anxious rather than nonchalant as we may want to be. And so it looks very different. The, the sort of the Montanian pattern looks very different when it becomes democratized and becomes a kind of default way of life um, for a whole people. So um, one way you can see that I think is in the way that our, um, you were saying that Mill, we, you raised the line that we, that we cite in our book um, from John Stuart Mill, who says Americans are all middle class, which basically, he, which is not like strictly speaking true, right? But basically he means that we've all got to try to make it on our own. We're all striving, right? To either attain a better position or at least keep the position we have. Whereas Montaigne could, you know, rest fairly well assured that he was, that he was going to maintain his, his position. So in a situation in which um, we're all middle class, we're all uh, we're all sort of striving. Um, there's a, a lot more anxiety built in to the situation, right? So whereas we um, we may uh, we we may idealize the mobs, we take the what we take from Montaigne is we say his his skepticism that one can ask about questions of the highest good, which becomes for us a kind of um, dogma or a kind of um, convention. Right, because in the United States, particularly at the time that Tocqueville was visiting, we don't really have a great diversity of um, intellects. We don't have much higher education. Everyone really is kind of figuring it out on their own. They don't have intellectual um, mentors or uh, to, to look up to. And everyone's equal, so they ha they're not going to defer to anybody. Exactly. Else. Right. And so we have we have the the dogma that everyone is equal, and that. Really, what we what we read, what we hear, or what we read, no matter what authority, but whether if it comes with authority or not, we should just take it as he says as information, right? Just process it yourself and make up your mind on your own. So that's the way that Americans kind of become Montanians, right? They they become kind of skeptics without really having gone through um, the struggle or the process that Montaigne went through with that. Ben, any want to add anything? Uh, no, I think I'll, okay. I'll, I'll leave it there on that one. All right. And, and what about the, the materialism of America and the fact that everybody has to work? How, yeah. How, how does that contribute to restlessness? Right. So the materialism kind of um, establishes or kind of grinds in this imminent part of the Montanian quest, right? And so we um, we literally just usually don't have the time to engage in um, the kind of non-material, um, uh, the quest for non-material things um, because we just simply have to make a, a living, right? And, but we get immersed, Tocqueville says, has this wonderful line where he says that um, you, uh, one attaches oneself more, uh, more securely or more profoundly to things that one must strive to attain than those things which one sort of automatically inherits, right? So Americans are, yes, they have to make their own way here, but they become more attached to making their own way and to the results of making their own way. What they've earned, right, is something you value much more than something you've just inherited or been given. So they, their imaginations are confined much more uh, readily to the imminent sphere. Now, Tocqueville has in this chapter, um, I, I think we mentioned earlier in the session long ago, um, Tocqueville has a chapter that was, re was really what got us thinking about um, how to approach this problem that we're seeing around us, this problem of restlessness, and it's called Why Are Americans So Restless in the Midst of Their Prosperity? And in that chapter, he gives what is basically a Pascalian critique of Montanianism we came to see after investigating this whole sort of intellectual history. And um, gives us a kind of Pascalian analysis of why the, these diverse imminent goods will never really satisfy. Um, and he says there that um, his analysis there is that as soon as you set your sights on kind of worldly rewards, you're aware that the clock is starting to tick, 
right? So you want to lose yourself in the pleasure of the moment. You want to be nonchalant and just enjoy the things you've earned, but you can't because you start becoming conscious that life is a span and that span is relatively short. And so therefore the time to enjoy your pleasures is limited, right? So your mind kind of spirals out of control in the way that Pascal um, identifies and, and, and encourages us to think about. Well, we think about it, if we, if we can't, um, if we don't have the sort of intellectual equipment or the intellectual um, assumptions that would allow us to begin a Pascalian quest, then we think about this in ways that kind of spiral in on themselves and make us anxious. We, we start asking, well, have I, have I sampled everything there is to sample? Have I moved quickly enough? Can I, did I fit it all in in my four years in college or you know, before I'm old or something like this? So we do question ourselves. We can't help but question ourselves. That's what Tocqueville sees coming out in a kind of you know, Pascalian mode, but we don't have the intellectual equipment or the, um, we have a kind of, our dogmatic skepticism prevents us from pursuing those questions in a way that would actually lead us on a kind of pointed quest. Yeah, which is very much where we started our discussion with the students not being able to decide between the different options, feeling a That's lack right. of a standard. And so it's just kind of, you know, uh, falling into a funk. We, we have several questions, so I want to go to some of those. I do want to talk about sort of your possible solutions. We've, we, we've kind of talked about this a little bit implicitly, but let's take uh, uh, some questions. And the first one is from a student uh, who writes, as a student, I can absolutely ensure you, in, assure you that the thought of restlessness is real, exclamation mark. I was wondering if you think that this ideal is worse within modern society with technology and the need for constant entertainment and why or why not that may be. Do you believe that modern progressivism could contribute to this as well? There's a, I, I'll think about that. Thanks for the question, which is, uh, I'm, I'm very glad to be assured that restlessness really exists. And uh, the- um, That was the, from Robert Moore, by the way. The, uh, well, thank you, Robert. The, um, on the word modern, just uh, I go back to something. That this this is related to Alan and, and Jenna's conversation earlier on this hour. What what we take to be the distinctively modern kind of restlessness, given that restlessness is a human thing, it exists as far as we understand it in all times and places. What's distinctively modern is assuming that you can't get anywhere by asking the question of how you should live. Therefore, trying to satisfy yourself by just kind of dabbling your way through the various pleasures of human life and then finding this is not working for me. That is what we take to be the, um, the, the distinctively modern version of this. Now, on your, on your technology point, I think it's really worth paying attention as young people to the extent to which uh, many of our technologies are designed to prey upon our restlessness. They're designed to make it worse. In other words, what tech companies sell is attention. They want to keep you clicking from thing to thing. They want to keep you engaged. And they know that you like distraction. <laughs> and so they try to feed it and they try to make you more distracted because that, that, that helps their bottom line. And so I think in this sense, yes, there is a way in which our technologies are uh, intended to make this problem more serious, which means that we have to think really seriously about how we use those technologies. And actually, I think, carve out some space in our lives that is free from them. They could do lots of great things like this conversation we're having right now. I don't want to, I don't want to uh, deny any of that. But at the same time, I think anybody who's honest about the way in which they interact with their own phone knows that it is sometimes a real problem the, uh, with respect to things like paying any serious attention to anything for a sustained period of time. Could I just add a brief remark to that, which is there's a wonderful book by Matt Crawford um, called The World Beyond Your Head. And um, in that book, he's talking about, as my husband said, how drawing our attention to the way, drawing our attention to the way that our attention is commodified, right? And the constant demands that are put and the kind of requests that our attention receives. And one of the interesting points he makes, and that really shocking points to me at the time that he made in the book, was that you need to pay to get into like a quiet place, right? It's the more expensive restaurants that are quiet. Only if you're like, um, you have like, I don't know, some kind of 
status in the airport that I don't have. Um, you know, <laughs> you can enter behind those doors that swoosh and, and shut out all the CNN and all the other stuff that they're blasting at your ordinary, you know, your ordinary passengers. And um, that was that was really shocking and kind of horrifying for me. So there's that message. But he also does a wonderful job of describing the world that lies beyond. Um, your head, that you can, the, the world of, of, of things that you can, and other people that you can engage with more deeply if your attention isn't diversified and distracted by um, these, these gadgets. Yeah, I, I love that point about paying for quiet, right? I mean, yes. if you just don't buy the things to begin with, you don't have to pay twice. Right? <laughs> uh, right. uh, okay, our next question is from our good friend, Shanisha Sauls. Uh, former member of the AU faculty and the school board of uh, the city of Baltimore. I'm the parent of three teenagers and employ a handful of 20-somethings. Is the issue that colleges and workforces are suited more for boomers and Gen Xers rather than the younger generation that is more in tune with feelings, emotional intelligence, mental health? Many of, many of us grew up learning that we had to do what we must to get what we wanted. Sometimes it worked out, sometimes it doesn't. But our students and younger colleagues seem to think there is an idealism about what school work, et cetera, is supposed to be and do for us. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. So, uh, Jenna, go ahead. No, go ahead if you have. Uh, the, uh, I, well, I agree with the point that um, I think we have we have a really hard time accepting that some things are just duties that you just have to do and they're not pleasant and you have to do them anyway. And that being asked to do that is not a degradation. The, uh, that, that is, that is just something that, that, that comes as part of being a human being and, and living in a community. And so I think we, we do the young a disservice when we don't expect them to, um, to live up to those kinds of, um, of, of not particularly lovely obligations. And so, you know, we notice this around the house when things get really intense on the academic front, our kids get more distracted from their household duties. And that's not actually good for them to be just like 100% the student and 100% cultivating themselves. All of us know when you get into adult life, you have to spend an awful lot of time changing the oil in your car or doing various things that nobody really wants to do. The, um, and we need to, it, we do a disservice for the young by not habituating them to that as just a fact of life that one has to live with. And in which one can find a kind of satisfaction if one bears the right disposition toward it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think I, I'm, seeing um, in your remark also something very true, which is that I think the restlessness of young people is exacerbated by our, um, the way that, I mean, we've found ourselves relieving our children of duties so that they can cultivate themselves. So what? So they can go to a good college, so they can be anything they wanna be, right? It's a kind of um, unanchoring them from who they are actually in the family and who they will be for the rest of their lives. People that have to care for their siblings and their parents, I hope. And um, to, you know, kind of embedded in the generations in that way um, in favor of a kind of vague hope that they will make of themselves something we don't know what, right? I mean, I think when, when, when I find myself very uneasy with that happening, but it's, it's encouraged by the kinds of demands put on them in the school and, and by their other activities. Um, and I, so I think that, um, and I think that is a particularly sort of democratic phenomenon. That's something that Tocqueville would recognize that we do, that we encourage people generally, as Ellen was saying, to think of themselves as equals who could theoretically achieve anything and therefore, you know, not necessarily as, as people who are embedded in different situations that primarily may need to learn how to deal well with the life that they've been um, given. Our next question comes from Jeff Burnham, uh, who is an adjunct uh, professor at AU. The scholastics defined happiness as, quote, the resting of desire in the loved object, per Elizabeth Anscombe, who taught a course on pleasure at the University of Chicago, in which she rejected all definitions of pleasure in modern philosophy as, quote, the joyless quest for joy. Thoughts? 
that's really good. <laughs> um, I think uh, the questioner's question points us to the genuine meaning of rest. Uh, we didn't mean to, uh, our, our point in this book was not to say, everybody take it easy, the, uh, which is, 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 is sometimes people take that away from the title and that, which is natural. Um, I, don't, I don't blame them for taking away that, but I, I don't really think human beings can take it easy. And actually I, I want them to be, if anything, more intense about the kinds of quests that they're on. But I think the, the questioner points us to the, the kind of rest that would actually satisfy a human soul, which is, um, mm -hmm. which is, uh, we're grateful for that. So thank you for the question. Yeah, well, can I, I'll just put another um, phrase on that. It was actually something one of our, one of our students said, which I think is a gloss of Anscombe, but I, she didn't know that. Um, <clears throat> she said one day coming out of class, happiness is knowing that you love the right things. Mm -hmm. Right, just trying to explain right. to our fellow students why she could find, you know, these ongoing readings and conversations that didn't leave you with just like an answer you could put on a three by five card and have, you know, but um, a kind of disposition with which you could go forth in your life, um, which was knowing that you're, 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 you love the right things, right? So resting in the desire of a beloved object is a kind of motion, it's a desire, it's a longing, it's a lack of completeness, right? Um, but at the same time, it's a, it's a restful, I guess, kind of completeness because you know that you're mm -hmm. doing something good or you have the, the deep faith and also validated by experience that you're loving something good. Yeah, and so to everybody out there and in, in the spirit of that, don't participate in those activities that you that leave you feeling emptier at the end than when you began, right? And okay, you do it once because everybody's doing it, and so you try it. But right, but when you have the experience, you realize, and then you can say no the next time. Okay, our next question comes from uh, my colleague Tom Merrill. What would liberal education have to be in order to address restlessness as you understand it? And what role do the mistaken thinkers, however you understand uh, who are the mistaken thinkers in liberal education as you understand it? Good. Uh, I've got a thought here, Jenna, but do you want to? Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, my, uh, one of my favorite uh, things that we considered in the course of writing this book is this great 17th century philosophic dialogue in which Pascal, this is actually a, a, a piece of, we, we describe it as a piece of Pascal, but it's actually written by somebody else who's describing a memory. It's like, it's like Plato's Symposium, right? Where it's like a memory of a guy of memory, you know, the, the, all the way back to somebody who was maybe there, but probably a little drunk. Anyway, so you don't know, that one doesn't know. If it's not actually, true, it doesn't matter because the, it still makes a point. That's right, that's right. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, one doesn't know how accurate this is to Pascal, but it sounds like Pascal. And it is, um, it's Pascal engaging with Epictetus and Montaigne. And Pascal doesn't think that Epictetus and Montaigne are right about things, but he engages with them very seriously. Anybody who reads the Pensee after, after knowing the, the essays well, it's all over the place. I mean, Pascal can't write a sentence without accidentally quoting Montaigne. It's, 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 it's a constant, the uh, preoccupation of his. And so he's deeply invested in this guy. And he, so he sets up Pascal, excuse me, he sets up Montaigne and Epictetus in this kind of war of the philosophic giants, the, um, the dogmatist and the skeptic, the Stoic and the Epicurean. And he, um, and he tries to show us how each one is right about the defects of the other and how that shows us that philosophy itself is ultimately unsatisfying and therefore that we have to go beyond philosophy and also describes for us in a way the, core, the character of what we're looking for beyond philosophy, which is this combination of greatness, which is kind of embodied by the Stoic philosophers, and misery, which he sees as the result of, um, of, of, of skepticism and hedonism. And he thinks both the misery and the greatness are true. And he thinks the greatest depiction of greatness and misery in human history is God on a cross. And he thinks that's what, right? Because what could be, what could be greater than God and what could be mis more miserable than the cross? And so in this sense, Pascal is engaging with people he doesn't ultimately think he have the right answers, but they help him see better 
the question that he's asking and understand understand the answer that he thinks there really is to that question much more deeply than he would have without his encounter with them. So in that sense, I think books that aren't right are nonetheless really important. <laughs> and, and at the end of your book, to maybe just bring in your conclusion here, you end up with the university, right? And you end yeah. up with, uh, you want to maybe just talk about a, a few other of, of the, the main points, your recommendations and that uh, about thinking and how the university should be the home for it. Sure, and I'll, I'm going to respond also to, to another part, I think, of um, Tom. Tom's question, too, and, and as well as this, which is that, um, you know, liberal education is supposed to be, is supposed to liberate you somewhat from the conventions of your time, right? I, I'm not one that thinks you can just discard those or ever get free of them, right? But it is supposed to take you outside of them, right? And allow you to see something of how you've been, you know, taught to think or the implicit assumptions that, that, that guide the lives around you and put them in some kind of perspective. Um, it seems to me that the way you, most universities are operating right now is, uh, is to be kind of at the whim of convention, right? They're sort of blown off too often. They're blown this way and that by things blowing through our culture, whether that be like, you know, fear of, um, of not getting jobs or you know, some social or cultural trend or hot thing, right? They don't have, a, they lack a clear sense of what liberal education in our time could be and therefore aren't really offering it, right? Because you have to have the kind of strength and vision to step outside of your time a little bit um, in order to offer a liberal education. Um, and the other thing I think a liberal education must do is to give you that perspective in order to live better like in your world, right? To contribute in some way to the civic life of your country, but also to, to be somewhat of an exemplar of somebody that can, because they've seen beyond things, can live a little better, right? And, uh, but that's all predicated on having some vision of what getting, you know, beyond our conventions in a way that's um, appropriate to our conventions could be, which I think universities should, could, you know, get a better handle on. Yeah. Our, our next question is, is another aspect of that, of, of uh, education. You've partly touched on it, but just if you wanted to say anything else, have you, it's from Philip Egan. Have you seen a transition of emphasis in undergraduate education from critical thought to career field training? And do you think that this contributes to restlessness of students? Actually, I, I'd say that, um, in a way, both of them uh, contribute to restlessness in the sense that um, people are very preoccupied about careers, of course, and they, want, and they ask of the curriculum, how is this relevant to a career? And, you know, on the one hand, I'm somewhat sympathetic to the desire, like people, this is America, people have to make a living. The, um, and so I think it's, uh, there, there's, there's something natural in that kind of question. But the the point of a liberal education is a, to allow you to think well about how you're going to make a living, which means not thinking about making a living directly right now. And so in this sense, I think that people should be more patient with disciplines and studies and courses that don't directly feel, uh, feed into any kind of career because they, they feed something else, something higher and better. That is um, that, and, and this is the only time in your life you get to do it. You get to reflect on the question of your whole existence and how you want to live it out. You had four years of relative leisure in which to do that. One should not discard this uh, because one doesn't. One is worried about being useful right now. You can only be really useful over the course of a life if you're willing to be useless the, uh, for a certain um, for a certain period of time. The second thing, though, is critical thinking. Critical thinking, I think, is the most overrated phrase in higher education. The, um, that is, we're way too critical. We criticize everything from the, uh, from, from the instant we start. And so one thing that we always try to practice in the classroom is what we call being our author's lawyer. And we ask our students to do it, too. That is, before you're going to, you know, if you take an author like Tocqueville or Montaigne or whoever it is, before you're going to criticize, you have to begin by appreciating. And everybody in our time has a million criticisms of everything, but appreciation is much less common. And so I think one thing that liberal education could actually do is help us to appreciate the good and true and beautiful things that are out there, the, which is really the standard of good judgment, right? You have, to, you have to have seen something really beautiful 
to understand why other things don't really cut the mustard. And so in this sense, we'd like to put a sort of appreciation back mm -hmm. in the driver's seat of, of education. Yeah. And a lot of times I think we, we take that for granted. We think appreciating things is easy or natural, but it's actually not. It's actually, it requires a kind of intellectual cultivation of discernment. Um, at, at least it's difficult, probably more difficult than criticism. Okay, great. We have two practical uh, leaning questions now, uh, but with a theoretical basis. Um, well, so we have these last three questions and then I'll have one final question and then we'll, we'll call it a day. Um, uh, so this is from my colleague, Sarah Hauser. Your argument seems to be that our restlessness comes from constantly trying to distract ourselves from our fear of asking the existential questions. And this seems like a plausible explanation. However, it seems also likely to be the case that one could face up to those existential questions while doing any number of jobs or careers. How do you see facing up to those existential questions as something which will help students to make decisions about their career? Good. Hmm. Um, well, I'll tell you how I often talk about it and I'm not, I'll see if this fully addresses the, your, your question here. Um, I think there are, you know, there are more and less meaningful ways to think about your careers. And what we're trying to do in the book is, 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 is help students think about their whole lives, right? Including their careers, but, but much be, I mean, I actually think in, in the university, we focus too much on that, right? Much of your life, more of my life is I think um, defined by my, my spouse and my children, my parents, right? Where we live than, than what I'm, than my career probably, or at least as much, right? Um, I started to say in our case because it's all so intertwined. But in any case, um, I think if I, I've, I've, if this is a practical question, um, what I often do is ask students when they're thinking about different careers or different paths after graduation is to think about what kind of person will this make me be become, right? What virtues will or habits, um, ways of thinking and ways of acting will it bring out and which ones will it make more difficult, right? Because I think you can envision much, you, you make a better choice about your career if you think about how you'll be formed or shaped by it, right? And therefore how your, your desires will be formed or shaped by it. And, and that's where I get to, those desires will be formed or shaped, those desires to, that are desires to know and also desires to, to, to be, um, worthy, right, will be formed or shaped by your career choice and also, very importantly, your choice of spouse and other things um, in a way that we don't think about often enough. I think that's very good as, a, as an encouragement to not think of your way of life and your career as the same thing because they're mm -hmm. not. There are all these other dimensions of your life that are really important. But I think, uh, I think another, and, and I think Sarah Hauser is, is, is certainly right that there are a variety of ways of making a living which are consistent with living a good and serious life. But I think there are also a lot of things that we celebrate in our time that are actually really prestigious and aren't really compatible with living a good or serious life. So for name example, a few, name yeah, a few. Well, all right, here we go. The um, finance, consulting, the, <laughs> you know, insofar as those things are pursued, because you just want money or because they're just the most prestigious thing or the, the thing that seems to come sort of naturally after graduation. If you're a consultant, you don't really wed yourself to anything. You know, you retain your proteanism sort of a little bit longer. The, um, I think we can think better than that. And I think our colleges and universities is really not a good mark about them, that the most prestigious ones graduate so many people into uh, fields of life that are, you know, I, I think we have some pretty good arguments are not gonna be that satisfying as long-term human occupations. Okay. We have two last questions before my final. And this is a practical question from Talia Weiss. What might be some implications on your work on restlessness for how to raise children? I know you could go on this for ages, but <laughs> let's be brief. Tell you wise, I think maybe was a student of ours at her talk. Perhaps it's, it's the same. Tell you wise, if so, hello. Nice to nice to hear see you uh, hear from you indirectly through <laughs> Al Um So restlessness and how to raise children. Um, 
my mind immediately well go ahead ben do you have do you have some thought building to talk always defer to the mother uh, I, I did i did my best the uh, but <laughs> the um i think uh pay attention to the children uh spend time in them with in spend time with them in rooms that do not contain phones or computers um try to let them have an undistracted life which it comes actually very naturally to kids mm -hmm. You know, there's this wonderful story in, in G.K. Chesterton where he talks about how kids, kids love to say to their, they, they, little boys will say to their their par their fathers, particularly, get it again, daddy, do it again, do it again, do it again. They don't get bored the mm -hmm. um, by the experience of throwing a ball or, uh, or whatever. And so in this sense, like, you know, we can help our kids, we can help our kids like avoid the, avoid restlessness, but they can also really help us because it doesn't, mm -hmm. It, it, it's not nearly as present in them as it is the um, for the uh, for the rest of us. Aha! <laughs> talking There's about one. an object lesson. The, the, <laughs> the, the, the question that they're talking about is how their talk applies to raising children. Just at the moment when you there's a child. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, teaching them to I think to go back to something we were saying earlier. Actually, so much of young of our life of, with young children is teaching them to appreciate things, right? And if you're teaching them to appreciate things, you're teaching them to dwell in beautiful things, right? And that that cultivates, instead of like always thinking about the negative, what do you try to cut out of your life? You have to do that. But if you think about, I think this is really what we're saying in the book, if you think about what you're trying to grow toward, those other things will fall away, right? Mm -hmm. And so teaching our, or just a lovely, beautiful music with our children and sitting through a, an entire you know record with them. Um, actually instills in them the desire and love to experience this beautiful thing, which you can only do um, by resting in it. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question on Tocqueville and then I'll ask a last question. This is from Jack Bavakwa, our former student, currently a PhD student at Notre Dame. It seems to me that Tocqueville is unique among your four thinkers in that he diagnoses restlessness as a, quote, political pathology, i.e. not primarily the result of our fallenness, but rather an unsettled political regime. First, would you agree with this interpretation? Second, what are the intellectual roots of this idea? Yeah. Who else would you recommend we read on this particular democratic psychological problem? Jack Bavakwa. Mm -hmm. um. So, rest of this as a political problem. Yeah, so, I mean, so, I think. We're, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh yes. So, um, is it, so Tocqueville, right? So, our in our analysis, um, I mean, you might say that restlessness was a kind of political problem that Montaigne was dealing with too. That's what I was sort of hung up on. It's a different kind of restlessness that Tocqueville sees um, around him, and um, so I'm. So I'm not sure I'd want to say he's the only one that sees restlessness as a political problem, but I think he sees the restlessness that we experience in our private lives, right, as a political problem that we can also see, you know, plaguing our common life uh, right now. I mean, we were struck when we were just thinking about this as uh, as a private problem. We we're thinking, well, what? Well, so what? People could say, so what? Right? So what? That these very privileged students are feeling unsatisfied with their personal lives, like boo hoo, right? And then we realize that um, the lack of direction in sort of a personal life, uh, particularly among the, the elite class, people who are going to be, um, you know, choosing to, to to be leaders in business and politics and and education and other fields, is really a problem for everybody, right? And so this personal problem does become a political problem in that respect. Yeah, I would just add uh, about the question of, of other things to read the, uh, on this subject. Um, I just encourage the, uh, th there's a, a lot of the stuff that's being written now about technology. Um, so I think it's Nicholas Carr's book called The Shallows, um, our friend uh, Matt Crawford's book on attention that Jenna recommended earlier. These are very interesting things that begin from a phenomenon that is right in front of our face, that is a big part of democratic life that all of us are dealing with all the time. And the best that these books trace these to really fundamental human concerns. 
and um, and they're really worth uh, they're really worth studying the um, in that regard. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to just preface my my last question with saying I know I wasn't the most gracious host. I gave you a hard time about Montaigne, but it's only because I agree with what your project is, and I think that Montaigne is also an important resource or could be an important resource to to deal with. It. But here's my last question. It has to do with love and friendship. Uh, one of the loveliest parts of the book is a very constant theme on love and friendship. On all of the authors, it comes up as an important way. Um, it, it, I have one particular question and one general. And the particular question is, on Pascal on love, you talk about him arguing that it's impossible for a human to love another human. And I wonder how, as a husband and wife working on this, <laughs> Uh, you uh, came to how, how you dealt with that argument. And my, but my general question is, um, what, can, what should we know about love and friendship that can help mm -hmm. us deal with restlessness? Mm -hmm. oh, that's so a, let's say something to the Pascal part, because I think you touched on something oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> really hard to wrestle with. I, um, we're both, or I'll, we're both quite compelled by many things that Pascal says, and I think we've, I think we've both stumbled over this part a number of times. And on the one hand, I, I think he's just not um, charitable enough here. He doesn't see, um, in, in in the sense that he doesn't see um, love as a phenomenon that is both um, sort of <clears throat> that is really should run through human life. But I think he does have it. I'll tell you why I think he does have a good point. That is finally, after a, a, a long time of just like rejecting that part of Pascal outright almost in my mind, I came to see. I think what he's saying there is, is, a, is, a, is his version of, or one of his um, points about, uh, to, to make us more aware of our vanity in the way that you drew out in Montaigne and Rousseau. And all three of those authors are quite good and making us aware of our vanity. And where Pascal really made sense to me here is when he said, we tend to set ourselves, when we're, when we're asking to be lovable, we're setting ourselves up as like kind of little gods for other people. And we can't really sustain that, right? And so he wants to sort of minimize the, the depth of connection between people because he thinks that encourages us to set ourselves up as in ways that, that we cannot bear. Right, and that actually make us unhappy and make others unhappy. And I, I think there is probably something to that. I think that means that, um, maybe to put it in kind of Aristotelian terms, right? Loving another person just by kind of gazing at them and seeing, you know, their their kind of um, what's what's so special about them is not as high a form of friendship as gazing at a at a at a at a third object, right? So loving. Um, the truth together for Aristotle, loving God together for Pascal. And I think that is true about, about human life that um, we find really the deepest and most enduring connections in striving to understand or to do things uh, together rather than just being kind of locked in a kind of fascination with each other. Yeah, that's a, uh, I think it's a very nice uh, way to put this. And I think, you know, for the for the young, it might be helpful to think that what one wants from love can't really be understood by looking directly at the other person and wanting the other person to be that thing. What the way that love manifests itself over the long term in a human life is in the form of common activity, common work. And that is. I think we tend to discount that kind of argument because it doesn't sound celebratory of the human enough, celebratory of the individual enough. It sounds like we're, we're aiming at something outside of ourselves. But I think aiming at something outside of ourselves is really the only sustainable way to, uh, to uphold human love, which is something that we're very interested in in this book. So I'm very appreciative of the question. Well, thank you very much for, for talking this evening. I, I really enjoyed it. And uh, it's an important book. Sure. I hope it gets intention. Thanks for okay. coming, everybody. Thanks so much, Alan. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. This is wonderful.